Good evening, 6 p.m. It's great to be with you. My name is Peter. Let's pray. To our great God in heaven, we give you thanks for your word. Father, as we come before you, may your word speak to us, teach us and mold us to be the people that you desire us to be. Amen. Now, one of the most precious and beautiful truths of the Bible is that our salvation is not dependent on our good works. It is solely dependent on God's grace and by faith in what Christ has done for us at the cross. But it's also a truth that is misunderstood and abused. Something that because we are saved by grace and not by works, then it doesn't matter what we do. We shouldn't worry about sin, since it's all going to be forgiven at the end of the day. But let me put it to you that we do not understand or appreciate grace until we know about sin. We do not appreciate grace and think it's okay to live as though nothing has changed when we came to know Christ. And I think this is what the passage is all about. And tonight we will pick up from last week's message. Last week we learned that we have died with Christ. Through His death, through His resurrection, Jesus has given us new life. And we're told to set our minds on things above and not on earthly things. So today in verse 5, Paul starts with an imperative. Put to death things that do belong to the old ways. Notice that Paul did not say put aside or tidy up or just hide them away. He is very direct and unambiguous. Put to death. In other words, destroy, execute, eliminate, eradicate, do not resuscitate. They are very strong words and leave no doubt in our minds of the dramatic changes that we must make in our lives. They sound extreme, and they are extreme, because we are dealing with sin here. They're not just minor traffic infringement or just a minor error in judgment. Sin is extremely repugnant to our God. So Paul says, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Paul is calling us to examine our lives and to confess any sins or worldly desires that we have not completely put to death. Perhaps we have secretly tucked them away, hidden them, and we bring them out occasionally, when the desires of the heart take charge. But Paul here is warning us not to treat this earthly desires like the chocolate treats that we have, that we bring out occasionally when we feel like indulging ourselves. The Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear in that sexual immorality is any sexual activity that is outside marriage, a marriage between a man and a woman. This includes premarital, extramarital, homosexual, sexual relations. You don't need me to tell you that sexual immorality is rampant in our society today. It is destroying homes. It is destroying lives. We live in a promiscuous society that is driven by sexual passions. Today, pornography is easily accessible and we are distracted, we are drawn to it. Sexual symbols and messaging are very common in advertising and movies. Just think of movies that you have watched recently. Very likely there will be scenes in it where it's a very simple messaging, man meets woman. Right. In a very short while, men and women develop 
a passion-filled twinkle in their eyes. And the next moment, they end up in bed having sex. That is no longer subtle messaging. It's very in our face. And we are conditioned to accept that sex outside marriage is not only acceptable, but is good. Christians are ridiculed and accused of living in the dark ages because of our teachings that sex is only in marriages. Instead, society today celebrates promiscuity. Just think of the Mardi Gras a few weeks ago. So we need to wake up to the fact that we are being influenced by society's declining moral standards and we compromise biblical teachings. Society has desensitized us and we may have gone too far to accommodate modern sensibilities. We don't like talking about sin. It's best to avoid the topic of sin because it offends our unbelieving friends. We prefer to talk about a living God. A gracious God is a wonderful messaging. So in our language, people no longer commit sexual immorality. People do not commit adultery. In our language, we prefer to use the term they are having an affair. In the spirit of inclusiveness, we go along with diversity, but with very little reference to God's definition of inclusiveness and diversity. We do not and cannot fully understand God's grace until we really get how offensive sin is to God. Sin has destroyed our relationship with our Creator. I'm not saying that the Bible is negative on sex. In fact, if you read the Bible, it has the highest view of sex. The Bible teaches that it doesn't matter whether you're young or unmarried or have been married for a very long time. The Bible teaches that sex is a purposeful gift of God that is to be guarded and protected as and only use for the God-intended purpose and use exclusively in marriage. Now, the second element in Paul's list that we are to put to death is impurity. This is more than physical sexual immorality and generally refers to any moral corruption or uncleanliness. Think of explicit sexual imagination, speech, thoughts, or deeds. The third element, last, is wrongfully directed sexual desires. In the New Testament, there's only two other occurrences of the word last. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul talks about the passionate lust of the Gentiles who do not know God. And in Romans, Paul talks about the shameful lusts of homosexuality. In all instances of the word lust, they refer to sexual sins. And also remember our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 5, Jesus said that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. So, Beware, get rid of them, put to death. Do not engage with pornography. You may think it's harmless, you may think that you can control yourself, but pornography corrupts our minds about sex and intimate relationships. We have impure thoughts and lust after unrealistic intimacies. The fourth element in Paul's list to put to death is evil desires. If you remember in chapter 1, Paul talks about evil actions, which refers to our propensity to sin. We just keep sinning. So we must honestly ask ourselves if we struggle with any of these issues. 
Uh, if you do cry out and seek help, or do we simply just hide them away, tuck them away, file them away, and pretend that everything's okay? The Apostle James wrote in chapter 1, Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So beware. And the fifth element, greed, is basically inappropriate desire for more. We are not satisfied with what we have and we yearn and covet for more. Greed can be the desire for more money, more things, more power. It can also be the desire to be sexually, to have more sexually than what is ours rightfully. Uh, this morning I mentioned greed in terms of money. For many of you here, you're starting out in your careers, you're looking forward to pay rises and more money. Can I tell you that all Australians earn the same amount of money? Not enough. Right. I've never been to a, or done a performance review where the guy sitting across me said, I'm happy, I don't need a pay rise. So greed is idolatry. Right, greed is idolatry. Greed desires more than what is rightfully ours. Greed also means that we are not content with God and we are not happy with, God, with what God has given us. Instead of setting our minds on things above, we set our minds on earthly desires. This is idolatry, putting something before God and turning away from God. We want to be autonomous. We want to pursue our own self-indulgent pleasures and ambitions. If you think about it, it's ironic that Paul tells us to put to death. Just think about it. The verse before, Paul already says, we have died with Christ. So if we have died with Christ, how can we further put to death. Right. While we already died with Christ and have died to our old lives, we still live in a fallen world. Right? Our new life is hidden with Christ. We still live in this fallen world where the old is not yet completely destroyed. The old world, with all its earthly nature, continues to exist and continues to assert its influence and distractions over us. John Woodhouse, the former principal of Moore Theological College, puts it quite succinctly. He says, If I don't deal with my covetousness, which is greed, I am likely to be in trouble with my desires. If I don't deal with my desires, I will be in trouble with my thoughts. And if I don't deal with my thoughts, then I'm asking for trouble in my actions. So, friends, this earthly desires must be dealt with. And it requires strong, decisive, radical actions. But if we are honest, we can't make these radical changes ourselves. We lack the discipline, the willpower, and the motivation. And more importantly, I don't believe that we have the desire to change. The motivation, <coughs> the motivation to change is just not there. But remember, we have the transforming power of Christ in us. God can do it. Christ can do it. Paul says in Romans 12, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. 
The power of Christ can transform us. The power of Christ renews our minds. So when we set our minds on things above, we are setting our life compasses to things above, to biblical teaching, rather than societal cultures and sensibilities. And notice now in verse 6, if the carrot approach doesn't work for you, Paul reminds you there is a stick. Verse 6, because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. God's wrath is His righteous anger against sin. God is holy and cannot tolerate sin. God's wrath is coming and culminates in His judgment against sin. The heart of the gospel of Christ is the forgiveness of sins. Because Christ has reconciled us and has made peace for us through His blood on the cross, we do not have to fear this wrath. God's wrath is not coming on us. In Christ, we have abandoned the old way of life that was bringing God's wrath on us. So, question we have to ask ourselves. Do we need any more excuses? Do we have any more excuses not to put these elements to death? In verse 8, Paul returns to his theme, but with a slight shift. Instead of using words like put to death, he now says put away. He moves from personal integrity, personal conduct, to interpersonal relationships and things that can damage our relationship and disrupt our community bond. Paul uses the metaphor of clothes. Take off the old clothes. Don't wear them anymore. They're ruined and disgusting. Throw them away and put on the new clothes. I must confess I'm a very old school, and sometimes when I look around, clothes that are brand new and expensive, to me, they look very tattered and old. To me, I tell my daughter, you need to throw them away, but they just cost a few hundred dollars. <laughs> so, put on the new clothes. These are the new clothes that Christ has given us. It's our new life in Christ. So put on the new clothes. And what does Paul say to put aside? The world today believes that we have the right to be angry if we think we have been wronged. Just look at the number of angry comments in the media or angry posts in whatever social media you use. We believe that we have the right to vent our anger and we usually don't hold back. We are quick to express our opinions and disgust. But do you see the irony here? The very people who brought the wrath on God to the world now think that they have a right to be the angry ones. We need to put away these anger-driven emotions and not fly off the handle at a drop of a pin. Malice is hurtful and nasty. In our social media postings, do we embellish our comments with malicious insinuations so that we can increase our likes? Slander is making accusations, defaming someone and destroying the reputation of someone. Again, do we make our comments juicier if we just slip in a bit of slander? In our quest to be liked by our social media community, do we participate in attacking the reputation of someone else? Do we gang up on someone that we do not like? Malice and slander could be just simple words that we tag on to our conversations or when we give unsubstantiated opinions. We may think they are funny and harmless, 
but they hurt and they humiliate. So we must discipline ourselves and get rid of this anger, malice and slander from our speech. Filthy language is disgraceful speech punctuated with obscenity. We may be accustomed to hearing them or even using them ourselves. We may have become desensitized to crude and obscene language, but that doesn't make it right or acceptable. Filthy language is often used in anger and slander and malice. The Apostle James again tells us that the tongue is like a fire. It is restless, full of deadly poison, and must be tamed. Malicious, slanderous speech driven by our self-righteous anger will burn like a fire, and it will burn uncontrollably. So our speech, our postings on social media, are they fueling the fire that is raging, or do we seek to extinguish the fires? And sometimes we don't have to use words. Emojis are great to convey things that people read into it. Why do we seek social media influences? It's a concept that I cannot fully understand. Again, it's because I'm old. I just don't get social media influences. Why do you follow them? Do they give you something that you're missing in your lives? The Bible tells us to only follow Christ and imitate Christ. In Christ, He is our perfect influencer. Right? In Christ, He is the perfect model of everything we desire or need. So if you have died to Christ, if you have died with Christ, put away all this damaging speech. Let the power of Christ transform and change what comes out of your mouth and keyboards and to put them into good order before God. From verse 9, Paul now addresses the corporate body of Christ. He says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. Paul here is addressing the assembly of united individuals. In such a setting, of course, the language must be truth and love. Individually, we are members, we are parts of the body of Christ, as part of the body of Christ, we have put off our old self and put on the new self. As such, our conduct, our actions, and our speech reflect Christ in us. Paul puts it in another way in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, Paul says, Take off your old self, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Put on the new self. There is new renewal taking place when we set our minds on things above. And this will continue and it will increase as we being restored to reflect Christ's glory in us. It is only by God's grace that we have this new life. This beautiful truth binds us all together as a body of Christ's united individuals. The things that we must put to death and put away are precisely the sins that destroy not only our personal integrity, but the community spirit and harmony of the body. Do not lie. So don't let anyone tell you that greed and Evil desires, lust, or sexual immorality doesn't matter. It's a lie. And don't let anyone deny or water down the impending wrath of God. And call out the lie 
if anyone tells you it's okay to be angry and malice and slander at obscene language are just part and parcel of modern life. Call out the lie. The body of Christ, the new humanity in Christ, is defined by a single entity, Christ. As we seek Christ, as we seek to place Him, we will discover possibilities of real fellowship with one another. In Christ, verse 11 tells us, in Christ there is not Greek or Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. There is no racial or ethnicity differentiation. There is no social, geographical or economic discrimination. In biblical times, the Greeks regarded anyone who is not Greek as barbarians. And the Scythians are the lowest of the barbarians. So in Christ, it doesn't really matter if you're Caucasian or Asian, black or white. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't even matter if you're a Westie or you come from Mount Druid. Sorry about the stereotype. Matt's not here. (laughs) It's only Christ who matters. Christ is in all. And Christ is all. He is the center of everything. He's in the center of creation, the center of redemption. Christ unites all because he dwells in us all. This, my friends, is true inclusiveness and diversity. It's diversity and inclusiveness in Christ, by Christ, through Christ and for Christ. Remember Paul's prayer at the start of the letter? If you turn to chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prayed that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Let this be our prayer for ourselves and for each other. Because this is the new life we have in Christ. All that it matters is that we've repented our sins and we have received Jesus as Christ, as Lord and Saviour. We have died and we have been raised with Him. It's only by God's grace and through Christ our sins have been forgiven. If you have not experienced this new life, please don't put it off any longer. I'm sure there'll be friends of yours that love to talk to you. Now, the unbelieving world would think that Christians are out of step with modern sensibilities. We are like dinosaurs. The world thinks that it is absurd that we still maintain God's commandments to exercise this gift of sex exclusively in marriage and to uphold the powerful goodness of sex in its God's design context. Christian views and Christian teachings are regarded as archaic and irrelevant. Instead, the world continues in their self-indulgent and idolatrous way and sadly disastrous way in ignoring God. But as Christians, we've been told today to put on the new life, to put to death and to put aside. So imagine if our lives are consistent with biblical teachings, where we set our minds on things above and our conduct and our actions reflect this new life in Christ. As the community in Christ, our speech is not for putting others down. It's not for expressing frustrations or annoyance in anger, not for lashing out in rage, not for embellishing our speech with malice or slander or laced with filthy language. Instead, our life 
and our speech are synonymous with building up, with encouragement, comfort, kindness, compassion, and critically from turning attention away from ourselves to Christ and His glory instead. What would the world think of us then? Would they still think that we are mad and irrelevant? I would say probably. But the unbelieving world would be amazed and will sit up and take notice and acknowledge that Christians do really have the real thing, the real hope in Jesus. So Christ is all and in all. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this new life that we have in Christ. We thank you that it's through you and by you and for you that we have this new life because, Lord, you are in all and you are all. Amen.